Good evening. I think we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Robbie. Welcome to uh, first of our evening keynotes our for Focus Series 2014. Uh, we're privileged to have Jamie Smith speaking tonight. Uh, we are blessed by him this afternoon with his talk um, throughout the afternoon and uh, over dinner with a few of us faculty this evening. Um, just by way of logistics, if you're not aware of the Focus schedule, you can find us at saufocus.com. Uh, there's a schedule that's posted outside the door that all of you came in. Uh, we're also on Twitter. You can use uh, hashtag SAUFocus. Um, and we're on Facebook as well, Focus Series 2014. You can see the full schedule of faculty workshops and events throughout the next uh, three and a half days. Uh, tomorrow evening, we only have one uh, faculty focus workshop schedule, and that's Ken Brewer um, and Whitman Gibbs 110 tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. So if you haven't already uh, reached your allotment of uh, required focus lectures that you've attended, I hope to see uh, many of you there at, uh, at Ken Brewer's talk tomorrow evening. Um, and I'm going to turn it over now to uh, CPLA Director Dr. Jack Baker, who's going to give a formal introduction of our speaker. Welcome, friends, to the second lecture of Spring Arbor University's Focus Week. As many of you know, this year's theme is work, a sacramental concept that we will explore throughout this week in multiple venues. In honor of this theme, I would like to begin with the words of the poet, essayist, and novelist, Wendell Berry. It's a big surprise. <laughs> Be thankful and repay growth with good work and care. Work done in gratitude, kindly, and well is prayer. You did not make yourself, yet you must keep yourself by use of other lives. No gratitude atones for bad use or too much. This is not work for hire. By this expenditure, you make yourself a place. You make yourself a way for love to reach the ground. In its ambition and its greed, its violence, the world is turned against this possibility. And yet the world survives by the survival of this kindly working love. Jamie Smith is an author and academic who has accomplished much work in gratitude, kindly, and well. A professor of philosophy at Calvin College, Jamie somehow finds time to be a prolific writer as well. He serves as editor of Comment Magazine and as senior fellow for the Colossian Forum, and has most recently published the second volume of his three-part cultural literature series for Baker Academic, titled Imagining the Kingdom, How Worship Works. I had the joy of first encountering Jamie as an undergraduate student at Cornerstone University, where he visited our upper level course on postmodernism in 2002, and I'm not sure if he remembers this visit. Uh, from even that early stage in his career, Jamie had been influencing the lives and minds of those concerned with how our faith becomes embodied. I'm only one of those lives he has helped shape. May your hearts and minds likewise be shaped by what he has to offer us this evening. Please join me in welcoming James K. Aisman. Good evening, everyone. Thanks very much for being here. It's an honor. Thanks for your kind introduction. Um, uh, it's been a pleasure to get to know Spring Arbor University today and to see what's happening here. And um, it's always fun for me. I learn a lot in these kinds of visits as well. I'm sort of a, an amateur ethnographer of Christian higher education. So I always enjoy looking in and peering into other institutions. The theologian Stanley Hauerwas once said that there is no education that is not a moral formation. There is no education that is not already a moral formation. We have a bit of a habit of thinking of education as a primarily intellectual project of depositing ideas into our sort of mind receptacles. But in fact, what's going on in an education is always a full orbs, whole persons, uh, full-bodied practice, set of practices that is actually shaping us not just into thinkers and not just what we believe, but also what we love. And so tonight I want to invite you to um, 
reflect anew on the task uh, that you are engaged in here, in learning, in teaching, in the project of Christian higher education. And I want to do that by ultimately inviting you to see it as a kind of reimagining. That, that part of what's at stake in being educated at a Christian university is to learn how to retool your imaginations. Now, one, uh, the other way I would like to frame this is to intersect with the theme for your week, which is this. In some ways, a Christian education is meant to prepare you so that you can be sent. That is, there's a way in which the end of your education at Spring Arbor University is a sending, a commissioning in which you are missionally sent out into the world to take up a whole range of vocations, all in the service of the risen Christ. And so I want us to think about that theme of vocation and to realize that if in a way you are going to be educated and equipped to take up a whole variety of vocations Christianly, we can't just attend to the ideas that are being acquired in your mind. We have to be equally intentional about the way your loves and longings and desires are being shaped and primed and aimed. So that in some significant way, a Christian higher education is a work of love. Now, there are a few different ways that, that we could come at this. These are all, you could think of these as all different angles to get to the same place. Uh, on the one hand, by the way, does everybody have an outline that you can follow along and doodle on as you're going? Okay, great, all right. Um, you can submit your best doodles afterwards for a free bottle of water. There's the prize right there. Um, there's, there's three different ways that I can describe this same revisioning project. On the one hand, we could say that Christian higher education is a project of reformation. Now, what I mean by that is, if you think of yourselves not primarily just as thinkers, but as lovers, <laughs> I actually think that the human person is defined by what we love, by what we long for. We are not primarily brains on a stick. We are creatures made by God to love God and to desire his kingdom. And in a way, what animates you, what defines you, what makes you what you are, is what you love. But the thing is, what you love is not always what you think. Because your loves and longings and most fundamental desires are actually shaped and aimed and sort of primed in certain directions, not just by what you think about, but by the practices, the embodied communal social practices that you are immersed in, which over time actually sort of train you to desire certain ends, right? So to be human is to be a lover. You can't not love. But the question is, what do you love? Who do you love? Who do you love, right? That's kind of a, um, the, who you love is, however, you don't get to just wake up on Monday morning and say, well, I'm choosing today to love this end. Because in fact, your loves and longings are something that are also shaped at an unconscious, pre-intellectual level. And so one of the things I want us to start thinking about is the way in which you are taught to love by cultural practices that you are immersed in but you are taught to love something other than the lover of your souls. So in that sense, and I'm, I'm that's the first book, but uh, um, that, that, in that sense, if we, if we had more time, we could talk about how what's going on in the project of a Spring Arbor education is again, not just equipping, equipping your minds and intellects, but ideally is also recruiting you into a project that is reforming your loves, okay? So a Christian higher education, a Christian university education is the reformation, the reformation of love. Or here's a, here's a different way to say the exact same thing. Christian higher education is the rehabituation of virtue. Now, what does this mean? Okay, this is, uh, so I'm asking you to put your thinking caps on here for a few minutes tonight. I'm a philosopher. 
I'm going to teach you Aristotle in 90 seconds. Here's how it goes. Okay? Habits, habits are internal dispositions to a certain end. Okay? So habits are these kinds of uh, um, under the hood of consciousness inclinations and disposition that you learn that make you the kind of person so that you sort of tend towards certain goals, certain visions of the good. To be, you tend to be a certain kind of person because you've acquired those habits. Yeah? In philosophy, the name we give to good habits are, any guesses? Virtues. Virtues are good habits. Okay? Now, what's interesting is Aristotle would say, we often refer to habits as second nature. Have you ever heard that? You know, oh, for her, that's second nature, or something like that. Why do we say second nature? Because it's something that you've learned to do, and it's become so woven into who you are that you do it without thinking about it. So for example, right now, you are all breathing without thinking about it. Well, now you are thinking about it, because I just said it. It's like, don't think about pink elephants. Oh, it's just a lot of pink elephants. Anyway, so uh, in first nature, right, as, as just biological creatures, we're sitting here breathing. Our first nature is in a way we're doing these things without thinking about. To acquire habits is to have acquired dispositions and inclinations that are learned. So we're not talking about biological hardwiring. But they're learned and acquired in such a way they get so woven into your character that now you just are the kind of person who does that, and you do it without thinking about it. So habits are second nature. Good habits are virtues. Bad habits then would be vices. Okay. Here's the piece that I think we, especially those of us who are Protestant Christians, don't always get. Love is a virtue. Right? Now think about that for a second. Love is a virtue. What does that mean? It means it's a habit. What does that mean? It means that it's something that you learn, that you acquire, that becomes woven into your character so that you become the kind of person who is disposed to act charitably, right? To act lovingly. What that means is that you learn to love. Now, last piece. Aristotle says you learn virtue in two ways. First of all, you learn it by imitating virtuous people, except what he calls exemplars, right? So the exemplars of virtue are the ones who model virtue. And to imitate them, in this, in this model, imitation is actually a good thing, because that's partly how you learn to act virtuously. It's how you learn to sort of put on the virtues. It's one of the reasons why if you get to visit those beautiful cathedrals in northern Europe, they are lined with stained glass images of the saints. Why? Because those are the pictures of the exemplars of virtue that we should want to imitate. The second way that you acquire virtue is by practice, by doing stuff over and over and over and over and over again. And so one of the things, again, this I think can sometimes scandalize us a little bit if you're an evangelical Protestant, is it means that you acquire virtue and you acquire the virtue of love through repetition, through doing things, through being engaged in practices over and over and over again. In that sense then, how are we doing? Does that make sense? Do you know what I mean? So love is a virtue and in, if all of our orientation to the world is to actually be shaped by the love of Christ and love for God's world. That means that a really impactful, sorry, apologies to English professors, that's a terrible word, a, 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 a Christian university education that seriously impacts your very core identity is ultimately one that has to rehabituate you. It has to retrain your dispositions. And that's going to happen not just in the curricular content that you are absorbing in the classroom, although that is crucial, and especially the reflection that you are engaged in there, it's also happening in a million different aspects of the ethos of an institution, 
in which you are absorbing an image of what the virtuous person looks like and are going through practices that teach you to put on virtue. So a Christian education is the reformation of our loves. It's the rehabituation of our habits, especially love. Third, and this is actually the way I want to talk about it tonight. Um, I should put my watch up here because I could talk about this for hours. Right? Um, uh, I want us to talk about how a Christian education is a re-narration of your identity. It re-narrates who you are. A Christian education that impacts the whole person restories you. It embeds you in a different story. It, it solidly locates your identity in the grand narrative of God in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And I want to suggest tonight that the restoring of your identity, the re-narration of your identity, is not something that only happens or even primarily happens on the register of the intellect. It actually is operative at the level of the imagination. So you have to learn how to reimagine the world. That's what a Christian education is doing. It's not only giving you a perspective on the world, it's not only teaching you how to think about the world, it's actually completely recalibrating the way you imagine the world, even before you think of it. So let me try to give, a, let me come up with a little bit of a sort of parable or illustration of trying to, that tries to picture this embodied education or what it means for our identities to be restoried. How many of you have seen the movie The King's Speech? Has anybody seen The King's Speech? If you haven't seen it, no big deal. I'm not going to assume that you've seen it. But those of you who have seen it, um, you've got sort of a well of images that you can draw on here. For those of you who haven't seen it, first of all, what's wrong with you? Secondly, it's a really great movie. And it revolves around um, uh, a character who is George VI. He's the Duke of York. He's played by Colin Firth. Um, he is a prince uh, who will be the successor of King George V. So you've got the Duke of York, George VI, and then you have this guy named Lionel Logue, who's an Australian speech pathologist, uh, not speech pathologist, sort of a speech coach. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, what is it? Yeah, speech therapist, yes, thank you, thank you. So you've got. George VI, the Duke of York, his whole family calls him Bertie. And you've got Lionel Logue, played by Jeffrey Rush, brilliantly, who is a speech therapist from Australia. By the way, that's significant because it's one of those colonies that was founded by criminals, and it's a long ways from London. Okay? What's interesting is that George VI, Bertie, is beset by a debilitating stammer which is really proving a challenge because his royal vocation requires public speaking of the highest order. And the specter of inheriting the crown sort of looms over him because of the illness of his father on the one hand and his, the embarrassing and compromising shenanigans of his older brother Edward on the other. So George's, uh, uh, Bertie's most faithful cheerleader is his wife Elizabeth who is played by the marvelous Helen Bonham Carter. She's been searching all over town for speech therapists who can help Bertie with his stutter, with his stammer, but to no avail. And here's what's interesting. Nobody has been successful at helping Bertie with his stammer because everybody treats it, I'm going to say, reductionistically. That is, they treat his stutter as if it had one simple cause. And there are sort of two different camps of people. On the one hand, the one group of reductionists think that the problem is entirely biological and mechanical. Okay? So let's call those the mechanists. They think it's really just an issue of kind of uh, um, physical mechanisms in his body. And so they recommend all these ridiculous things and, and therapies and stuff to try to change his throat. They're like, oh, you should smoke. It'll relax your throat. That'll work better. Or fill your mouth with marbles, and that'll stretch out your cheeks, and you'll be able to speak, as if it's just a biological problem. Yeah? 
There's another group of people who also treat the problem reductionistically, but instead of being biological mechanists, they are, we could call them intellectualists, and they think Bertie's problem is entirely in his head, right? That it's really just a problem of his thinking, of his choosing, of his willing. And so uh, uh, they just constantly sort of berate him to choose to speak properly. As if, as if the reason he stutters is because he like, doesn't know something or he's, he's making bad choices or he lacks knowledge. And unfortunately, the worst person who embodies this is actually his own father, who thinks that, that Bertie is just lazy or stupid or, or uh, uh, recalcitrant and won't do what he's supposed to do. And so his father is this eloquent, you know, beautiful, uh, sort of Shakespearean speaker who uses the wireless technology and does these wonderful Christmas broadcasts. And one of the most heartbreaking scenes in the movie is when the father, King George V, finishes one of these speeches, which is such a model of eloquence, and he turns to Bertie and he mocks him, as if this will somehow help. And then he simply says to him what sounds like it might be an encouragement, but it's not. He says to him, easy when you know how. Do you notice how he put it? Easy when you know how. As if Bertie's problem was a problem of knowledge, of intellect. So the king sets up Bertie for some practice. He sits him up in front of this micro. You have to learn to speak. Have a go yourself, he says. Sit up, straight back, face up, boldly to the bloody thing and stare it square in the eye as you would any Englishman. Show who's in command. But the efforts are pointless, they're hopeless. His father is trying to impress upon him the urgency of being able to do this. And so he just keeps berating him. Come on, choose to do this. Relax, just try it, do it. But neither the mechanism that treats it as merely bodily, nor the intellectualism that treats it as merely a head problem, neither of those strategies actually makes any difference. And that's what brings them to Lionel Logue's office. Lionel is very unorthodox. And Lionel is going to see that actually the issue is at the intersection of mind and body. That in fact, the reason why Bertie stutters is not just because of something in his head or just because of a biological problem. It's something in the center of him. It's something in this between space. And he needs to dig down and figure out what that is. And so he invites the prince into his fairly seedy East London home. He insists on calling him Bertie, which the prince is not super enthused about. But he establishes my castle, my rules. And then he has a conversation in which he asks Bertie, the prince, what was your earliest memory? What was your earliest memory? I'm not here to discuss personal matters, the prince says. But Lionel won't be dissuaded from this line of questioning. When did the defect, the stutter, the stammer begin? Bertie tells him, I've always spoken with a stammer. And Lionel says, no, you didn't. No one starts speaking with a stammer. So when did yours start? Bertie won't answer these questions. He's not going down that road. He refuses. He says, I thought you came here to fix my speech. And now you're asking me all these stories about who, who I am. Here's what Bertie didn't realize. Lionel is trying to dig down into his story. Lionel is, is trying to get at this gut level, imagination level space that arises at the intersection of body and mind. Because if there's going to be change for Bertie, it's going to be a kind of kinesthetic conversion at the intersection of his body and his story. So when Bertie eventually returns to Lionel seeking help, we can see him, uh, uh, he, Lionel kind of gives him this regimen that involves all these sorts of bodily exercises. I don't know if you remember, like, like uh, um, Elizabeth has to sit on his belly while he's working his diaphragm and he's like singing up and dill, the Jack and Jill, right? All these crazy things with his body. Those are important, but they don't solve all of his problems. He's not in any danger of being described as eloquent. 
And that's why Lionel has to keep digging down, trying to get to the bottom of Bertie's story, drilling down to the narrative that he now carries in his body, the tale that has tied his tongue. So there seems to be new openness and vulnerability when Bertie comes back to visit after the death of his father. So you know what this means. His father is dead. Bertie's going to be king. He walks into Lionel Logue's office and he sort of surprises him and his Lionel's boys are there playing with model planes and Lionel shuttles them away. And Bertie looks at the toy plane sitting on the table and he says, I always wished I could have built models. And he says it sort of wistfully so you know he actually never got to do this. And Lionel sort of sees an opening, an opportunity to get at something here and he makes him a deal. He says, how about you, I'll let you glue a piece on the plane every time you tell me some part of your story, right? So this is now the coming king of England, and he makes this little deal. I'll let you play with the planes if you will tell me part of your story. But this is actually because Lionel is concerned about what it is that has tied Bertie's tongue. So Bertie starts to recount different aspects of his story. And as he's gluing a piece on the plane, he asks, Lionel asks Bertie, are you naturally right-handed? Left, Bertie says, but I was punished. So I learned to do everything with my right hand. Any other corrections, Lionel asks. I had knock knees. He was forced to wear metal splints to correct the, prob a pro the problem, a solution that was agonizing for him. But straight legs now, he notes very wryly. As Lionel tentatively explores Bertie's story and family dynamics, he wonders who Bertie felt closest to. His closest relationships, it turns out, are with nannies. Not my first nanny, though, he says. She loved David, hated me. When I was presented to my parents for daily viewing, she'd pinch me so that I would be removed from the room quickly. I'd cry, I wouldn't eat, and it gave me stomach problems, even until now. And Lionel's starting to see a pattern in this story. In this brief testimony, is going to be a turning point for Bertie because Lionel realizes that the only adequate prescription for Bertie's stammer is re-narration. The stutter, you could say, burbles up from a submerged story that Bertie carries in his gut. So if he's going to speak differently, if he's going to speak well, then he needs to tell himself a different story. But at that unconscious level at which we all tell ourselves stories, that we never hear. Any hope for Bertie's eloquence is bound up with a reconfiguration of his very bodily comportment to the world. But that is bound up with a story that is submerged in his body. If Bertie's going to find his voice, he needs to be re-narrated into a different story. Well, the urgency of this gets amplified because Hitler's marching across Europe. Britain's going to be entering the war. They need the monarch to be a leader. And Bertie has to give the speech of his life. And so he comes back to Lionel for help and says, I need to deliver a Christmas speech. And Lionel says, oh, like your dad used to. But he's not here anymore. Yes, he is, Bertie retorts. He's on that shilling I just gave you. Lionel gets at something deeper here, and he sees an opening for re-narration. Easy enough to give away. You don't have to carry him around in your pockets anymore. Or your brother. You don't need to be afraid of the things that scared you when you were five. You're very much your own man, Bertie. Your face is next. Do you see what Lionel's doing? Lionel is inviting Bertie into a different story. But that invitation to re-narrate his being in the world is not unconnected with the sort of physicality of who he is. 
It's at the intersection of his body and his story. It's because we carry a story in our bones that we comport ourselves to the world in certain ways. So Lionel is trying to retrain Bertie's body and soul with a story that I think to us as Christians should sound very familiar. The story is simply this. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. And when on the eve of his coronation, Lionel finally coaxes from Bertie the shouted claim, I have a voice! Lionel's quiet reply reiterates this new story. You're the bravest man I know, Bertie. And you'll make a bloody good king. Friends, I invoke this cinematic vignette to help us appreciate the story-making power of unconscious formative rituals. Our hearts traffic in stories. As the novelist David Foster Wallace once put it, we need narrative like we need space-time. It's a built-in thing. We live also at this nexus of our bodies and stories, this sort of between space where the aesthetic force of a narrative or poem captures our imagination because it resonates with the bodily attunement that so fundamentally governs how we inhabit the world. You could say that the imaginative logic of poiesis, of, of the arts, of making, kind of plucks our deepest heartstrings, and that aesthetic resonance reverberates in deep corners of our unconscious, attuning us in ways we aren't even aware of. The imagination is this way that we relate to the world that operates under the hood of our consciousness and yet is governing so much of how we live and move and breathe. It's a story that provides the moral map of our universe. It's narrative that trains our emotional, perceptual apparatus to perceive the world as meaningful. So I want us to think about, in this second section, I want to think about the dynamics of how we learn to imagine the world even before we think about it. And I want to talk about that in terms of conscription. So this is 2A, from con conviction to conscription. A friend of mine, uh, a political theologian named William Cavanaugh, has a powerful little book called The Theopolitical Imagination. And it opens with a scene from which he, he generates a kind of a difficult, disturbing question. The question is something like this, I'm paraphrasing. How does a provincial farm boy from Nebraska become convinced that he should go to a country he's never heard of to kill people he knows nothing about. How does a provincial farm boy from Nebraska become convinced to go to a country he's never heard of to kill people he knows nothing about? Now, I'm not here to debate just war pacifism. I'm not interested in the particular answer to that question. I'm interested in how someone reaches that conclusion. And for Kavanaugh, it's important that we realize that we come to such a conclusion not as the deductive finding of a syllogistic argument. You don't, you, it's not a matter of sort of deductively and cognitively and intellectually running through a bunch of options and then coming out with a conclusion that says, this is a really good idea. It's not a matter of calculating a cost-benefit analysis and then having this sort of rational conclusion in which that's a good idea. Instead, you have to think about it as a conscription of that young man's imagination by a story that then makes sense of why he would do that. It is a narrative logic, you could say. Now, how did that young man, how was that young man's imagination captured in such a way that it makes sense for him to go to a country he's never heard of to kill people he knows nothing about. Not primarily or only because he has been fed information that convinces him 
about that. Instead, it's because his imagination has been shaped by rites and rituals and rhythms and you could even say liturgies that have told a story that have sunk into his bones. How does that happen? Well, it's not like uh, um, you know, he's read books and books and books that have convinced him of, that this is a good idea. It's been a simple little operation. I imagine two ways that this young man's imagination is conscripted into this story. One is at the beginning of every day of almost his whole life, he has said a creed with a whole group of people. And the creed is, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I'm Canadian, so I don't know the rest, OK? Uh, um, now, all I mean to say is, that's a tiny, it seems like a tiny little thing. But when you stand to say it, as a group, at the beginning of each day, over a lifetime, it has a rehabituating effect. It has a re-narrating effect. You are being invited into a story by reciting it over and over again. The other imagination-forming, myth-making practice that has reinforced this is Friday Night Lights. Every high school football game this kid has ever gone to has opened with a, pa a tiny little pageant of colors and flags and a song and all the ruckus of these two high schools that can't stand one another goes pin drop still as everybody stands to sing the anthem, see the flag, reinforce a story. Have you ever asked yourself why we play the national anthem at local high school football games? Like when you go to an orchestra concert at your high school, did everybody stand and do the national anthem before that? Did any, did anybody, has anybody ever gone to an orchestra where you did the national anthem? I would be fascinated to learn if you did. All right, my data is standing up. Nobody sings the end. Why? Because there's something going on about a story that's being told here. Now, take that high school football game experience every Friday night, and now ramp it up, and now it gets folded into every Super Bowl he's ever watched. You know the pageantry of the opening of a Super Bowl game, right? The flag is as big as the field. There's all these little kids who are making it wave and shimmer. And somebody comes out and drags the national anthem out into some 14-minute song. And, and I don't know if you've noticed, but the American national anthem is tad militaristic. <laughs> sort of presumes a little bit of a military sort of context. And then what at the Super Bowl, how does every national anthem end? Applause and a military flyover, right? Where was it? They were in Jersey this year. There are no jets nearby, apparently, but we got helicopters, right? There's some, what I'm saying is there is a story being told in those rituals that isn't trying to convince your intellect. It's trying to conscript your imagination. And it's conscripting your imagination by, in a way, pulling you into a story about power, about might, about a place in the world. And then it makes sense for that young Nebraska farm boy to say, this seems like a good idea. It makes sense if you've been formed in that story. So I think part of what I want you to start appreciating and thinking about is what stories, what rituals, what liturgies, for me, liturgies are enacted stories, OK? What liturgies? are captivating your imagination. Because the way rituals work on you, the way these, these, these liturgies work on us, is precisely because they tap into our imagination. So they re-story the imagination. They, they, they re-narrate our identity and our loves. Maybe we could put it this way. There was an old sexist adage, uh, which is, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. It was sexist, but still pretty true. Um, uh, let's, let's come up with a sort of analog to that, which is this. The way to the heart is through the body. 
The way to your heart is actually through your body. Through tactile, visceral, visual, sensible, and sensual realities. The way to the heart is through the body. And the way into the body is through story. By the way, if you want a brilliant illustration of the fact that the way to the heart is through the body, I want you to reread the very last chapter of Orwell's 1984. How many of you have read 1984 in high school? Okay, I want you to try to think back. We won't do this now, but think back to how he's taught to love Big Brother. It's entirely tangible and visceral. So narrative stories that capture our imagination in a way tap into our bodiliness, our embodied attunement. We are, you could say, characterized. We, we don't maybe always realize how much we imagine ourselves as characters who then live into a story. So that young Nebraska farm boy, in a way, has, has absorbed a myth which is a grand plot about what matters. And now he is acting as a character in that story and he's living towards an end and a goal. It's not because of any argument he ever encountered that convinced him of this intellectually. It's because of the myth-making rituals he's been immersed in that have captured him imaginatively. So we absorb stories on a register we don't always realize. You don't always know the stories you really believe. We aren't always very reflectively aware of the stories that govern what we want, what we love, what we long for. That's why we don't always love what we think. So, what I want to do is, um, in, in the bit of time I have remaining, is I want to give you two little sort of high-octane injections of French philosophy as little catalysts to give you resources for rethinking how you inhabit the world. Okay? So I'm a, I'm a philosopher, I'm a Christian philosopher, but a lot of the sort of strategy for me is often looking to, admittedly, um, if this doesn't freak you out, non-Christian philosophers, nonetheless, who seem to get something about the world that then become a catalyst for us to remember things that we should know as Christians. And I want to draw on two little snippets. One is from a, a French philosopher named Maurice Merleau-Ponty, uh, and the other is a French anthropologist named Pierre Bourdieu. I'm going to do this really easy. I know it's late. Uh, I don't want to punish you. But I, there's two little insights here that I want us to get. On your outline are a couple of quotations. Right? I want you to look at the first quotation, because what Merleau-Ponty does is he gives us a new appreciation for recognizing that our habits and our habits of imagining are actually really tied with our embodiment, with our gut. Um, and he says this. This is the quote number one on your outline. It is the body which understands in the acquisition of habit. Now, that's a weird sentence already, right out of the gate. Because you wouldn't ever think that bodies understand, right? You normally think what understands? You think minds understand, brains understand or something. But he says, our bodies carry in them an understanding of the world, and that's part of what habit is. And so he meant, he says, well, this will appear absurd if you think understanding is really just head knowledge. I'm, I'm paraphrasing now. But he says, look at the italicized line. The phenomenon of habit is just what prompts us to revise our notion of understand and our notion of the body. Here's, here's the simple takeaway. You might think about the world with your mind, but on some level you understand the world also with your body. And Merleau-Ponty would call that know-how. Know-how. It's a kind of understanding that we carry 
at this unarticulated level. Let me give you one easy example. This, this will be an analogy. How many of you are musicians? Anybody like pianists or violinists? Okay. If you are a, an accomplished musician, your fingers understand things that you don't have to think about, right? Does that make sense? That's what it is. That's what all that practice happened. So that in fact, you are engaged in, in, in making music your body knows stuff, right? It knows how to get things done. And it's not like every time before you, I, I am not a musician. I have a banjo, which I bought after the first time I ever heard Mumford and Sons, but I still haven't learned how to play it, okay? That's my lifetime goal. Next sabbatical, learn the banjo. But I know, I, I at least know this, if you're playing your violin or playing a piano, you don't cognitively process, okay, now I need to put this finger here and this, right? I mean, you're not thinking through it. Your body knows. And that's kind of what Merleau-Ponty means by habit. That actually habit is a kind of know-how that we acquire. So it's almost like, think of it this way. You acquire a feel for the world. You have a kind of know-how about the world that you can't put into words and yet is a way of understanding the world. I was looking around to try to find an illustration of this, and the one that I've landed on is um, actually an example from tennis. And it comes from one of my favorite novelists and writers named David Foster Wallace. Any David Foster Wallace fans here? You're all dead to me now. Um, <laughs> seriously, are we done? No, I'm just kidding. Um, okay, so David Foster Wallace, now it's important, I think, to realize that he himself was an accomplished junior tennis player. And this is from a brilliant essay on Roger Federer, who probably is the greatest tennis player who has ever lived. And here's what Foster Wallace says about Federer and about tennis. Success, this is quote two on your outline. Successfully returning a hard serve tennis ball requires what's sometimes called the kinesthetic sense meaning the ability to control the body and its artificial extensions through complex and very quick systems of tasks. English has a whole cloud of terms for various parts of this ability. Feel, touch, form, proprioception, coordination, hand-eye coordination, kinesthesia, grace, control, reflexes, so on. For promising junior players, refining the kinesthetic sense is the main goal of the extreme daily practice regimens we often hear about. The training here is both muscular and neurological. Hitting thousands of strokes day after day develops the ability to do by feel what cannot be done by regular conscious thought. To do by feel what cannot be done by regular conscious thought. You wanna lose a tennis game? Start thinking about every shot. I, but one time I, I, um, uh, I, I do enjoy golf, and uh, one time my friend of mine told me the best way to beat your brother is to give him a book about golf, because then he'll be thinking about everything, right? To do by feel what cannot be done by regular conscious thought. That's what he calls this kinesthetic sense. It's what Merleau-Ponty calls this know-how. Here's the theme. I just want to sort of prime a, an imaginative pump for you. What if Christian faith was also a kind of kinesthetic sense? Or what if learning the Christian faith was not just knowing how to talk about the Christian faith, but was actually learning how to do by feel what cannot be done by regular conscious thought? In other words, what if the goal of a Christian education was not just the acquisition of Christian perspectives and Christian thinking, but a Christian imagination, Christian habit, Christian know-how, so that you become the kind of people who do by feel what Jesus would do. That's kind of the project that we're talking about. Second theme, and a second intuition, to sort of prime a pump here, is what I'm gonna call pedagogies of insignificance. This is an insight that comes from a French anthropologist, social scientist named Pierre Bourdieu. So as an anthropologist, Bourdieu spent his time trying to understand non-Western cultures, okay? 
Do you have an anthropology major here at Spring Arbor? That's actually pretty rare at Christian College. Okay, anyway. So as somebody who's trying to understand non-Western cultures, Bourdieu couldn't just rely on what people said. He had to learn how to sort of read their practices. What understanding of the world was carried in their rituals, their rites, their practices? And so he hit upon this, I think, really illuminating concept. Look at quote number three on your outline, just very quickly. One could endlessly enumerate the values given body, made body, by the hidden persuasion of an implicit pedagogy which can instill a whole cosmology. Okay, <sighs> sorry, this is really mean to do to you so late after dinner. I, let's just home in on that one phrase. He's talking about practices, pedagogies, ways of learning, apprenticeships that do this. They are an implicit pedagogy, they're covert, they're sort of under the radar, you don't realize it. And they instill a whole cosmology. Let's say the synonym for cosmology is, do you ever use the word worldview around here? Sort of a worldview, a big understanding of things. What Bourdieu says is there are these little practices that we do that are actually instilling a whole grand cosmology. Like, he says, through injunctions as insignificant as sit up straight or don't hold your knife in your left hand and inscribe the most fundamental principles of the arbitrary content of the culture in seemingly, a very important word, seemingly innocuous details of bearing or physical and verbal manners, so putting them beyond the reach of consciousness and explicit statement. You see what he's saying? What, he, what he's getting at is this. When you are told to not hold your, what is it? Don't hold your knife in your left hand. Yeah. He's like, that seems like a totally minor thing, like big deal, whatever. But what he says is actually when you start to analyze it, that prescription, that expectation is sort of nested in a whole way of life and you are actually learning how to be civilized. You're learning how to inhabit a culture and you are absorbing a cosmology. Look at, he puts this I think even more strongly in quote number four. The cunning of pedagogic reason lies precisely in the fact that it manages to extort what is essential while seeming to demand the insignificant. These pedagogies of insignificance, these little rituals that you do, seem to demand the insignificant, but are actually extorting the essential. They are shaping, the, what seem to be little things are actually teaching you big things. There's an illustration I, of this I ran across in General, McChrist, General Stanley McChrystal's autobiography called My Share of the Task. McChrystal was a student at West Point in the 70s and was very excited when a high-level colonel was coming to lecture the students because he was so excited to hear somebody who would be talking about, you know, the strategies of war and the grand theorizing of war and things like that. And he was so puzzled because when this guy got there, here's what he said. Gentlemen, this is quote five, soon you will begin to wear the class shirt. You'll wear it every day of the academic year. And per uniform regulation, you will secure your collar stays that have been issued to you. Okay? So McChrystal's so excited, this grand theorist of war strategy is coming to lecture them. And for the first 30 minutes of his talk, he says, now when you put your uniform on, you have to use the collar stay and it goes right here. And he kept talking about this, like droning on about this collar stay that had to go on their collars. And McChrystal's like, what? What is going on? It may seem insignificant to you now, he continued, but you're here learning attention to detail. For the next few minutes, the combat season colonel compared neglecting to wear collar stays with forgetting ammunition for soldiers in combat. Focusing on even the small things he reasoned developed a leader who never neglects the critical. Do you see how? In fact, there are no small things. Because all the little things get nested in a bigger story about who we are and what's significant. I'll give you one last illustration that we can have some, some conversation about this. Think of Bourdieu's point as this. Micro practices 
have macro implications. Seemingly innocuous rituals can actually be teaching you to love something ultimate. This hit home for me when I was um, watching a beer commercial one day. All great truths of American culture are embedded in beer commercials. And um, this was a, actually a commercial for really bad beer. Not that you should know that, but it was Michelob Ultra. Brutal. Um, if you ever become rebels, at least don't do it with Michelob Ultra. <laughs> Sorry. I leave in like 10 minutes, so. Um, now, what was fascinating was, okay, so it's a beer commercial. So first red flag is, that means it's going to be entirely sexist, right? You know, how, that's how beer commercials work. So, bunch of guys come out of their office building at the end of the day, it's 5 p.m., they come out, the, their car is waiting there, it's time to go home. Uh, leave the office, it's really a junky car. It's not a car that anybody wants. So one of the guys does this. And lo and behold, this fantastic, awesome car that they would want is there instead of their piece of junk. Yep. It's a beer commercial, they're magically transported to a beach. Okay? <laughs> Off in the distance, they see some young ladies that they would be interested in. I warned you, right? It's a sexist beer commercial. Um, they can't really tell, so they're a little bit interested, but they're a long ways off, not sure how it's going to go, so they do this. Does that look familiar? That move? All of a sudden, the ladies are up close, and it's a beer commercial, so they're super interested in them because they are drinking Michelob Ultra. Yeah. <laughs> Magically transported to a club. DJ on the stage, playing stuff they don't like, so once again, they do this. And the DJ they want is right there. What's, what are these moves? What's going on? What's this? Right? This is how I interface with my world now. This little caress is how I get what I want. And what's interesting is this little machine, right? We're not even talking about the content I'm looking at. That's, that's irrelevant at this point. What I'm saying is the very micro-ritual of how I interact with this machine has taught me that all I have to do is make moves like this, and this, and this, and I should never ever be bored. I should never ever be unhappy. I should never ever have to deal with things I don't want to deal with, because this thing puts what I want in my hands, on my terms, whenever I want it. And so this micro-ritual actually turns out to have macro implications that are brilliantly pictured in the beer commercial. Because now what's happened is I transfer my way of interacting this with machine and now it becomes my cosmology, right? It becomes my worldview. It's like, well, I don't want this car. I want the car I want. I want the girls I want. I want them to want me. I want the music I want to listen to. I want everything. I want the whole world to answer to my tastes and preference at the moment. That's called egoism, narcissism, <laughs> solipsism, and you learned it here. Right? Not because when you bought your iPhone, it said, oh, here are the 16 fundamental beliefs of Apple, and one of them is that you are the center of the universe. <laughs> it doesn't happen didactically like that, right? It doesn't happen informatively. It happens ritualistically. You learn it through the rituals. And so it's one of the reasons why we don't have time, to, unfortunately, to talk about this tonight, but it's, it's precisely why. The formative learning that characterizes Christian education has to be accompanied by the rituals that implant a Christian imagination in you. It can't just be disseminating Christian information and ideas and beliefs and doctrines. This formative project has to be sustained and nourished by lives we share together in which we inhabit the Christian story liturgically through rituals. You see that rituals now are not bad things. It's not a question of whether you are immersed in rituals. It's which. You're immersed in rituals all the time. You're immersed in little micro-liturgies all the time. The question is, in what way is the Christian story getting hold of your imagination? And not just being something that's deposited into your intellect, but is actually recruiting your imagination, conscripting your imagination, forming your love. This is why I'll, I'll, I'll close with this. It's why um, the history of the Christian church 
has always appreciated that the rites and rituals and liturgies of worship and the tangible, tactile, visceral disciplines of the spiritual disciplines are conduits of the spirit. They are habitations of the spirit. We have a bit of a tendency to bifurcate these things and we think, well, either we are these, you know, the dead orthodoxy of ritual or the vibrant dynamism of the spirit. That's a false dichotomy. And as long as we keep telling ourselves that, we will continue to be actually conscripted by false rituals. What we need to realize is that the spirit gives us the gift of practices that re-narrate our identity. We're all Bertie. We all have stammers. We all need to be re-narrated into Christ. And the gifts that Christ gives us are the practices of his body, the disciplines of the church, which are aimed at and are recruiting our loves and longing because they capture our imagination. Thanks very much. We have some time for questions. Hey, thanks a lot. We really, really appreciate that. You're welcome. Um, so is there, is there a place if virtue is in the habit then, um, looking at Aristotle's like excess and deficiencies, is there, is there, can you speak to like what might be, um, could, could we get the cart before the horse and, and the excess of trying to incorporate certain habits into our life to, you know, and, and fall off the deep end in that, in that side? What, what would, um, I, I think I'm totally with you. Just tell me what falling off the deep end would be. Um, I, I mean, your last point, um, you know, looking at bringing that into like a kind of liturgy, I think is, is it was a great example, like a dead kind of orthodoxy yeah. or that, that false dichotomy, you know, yeah. it's wonderful. Um, you know, how can, if we're trying to do that in our own life, you know, how do we avoid the kind of dead orthodoxy kind yeah, of yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. vice that um, Yes. Um, you'd think I'd have a quick, easy answer to this. And it's actually a really, it's a challenge, isn't it? I mean, uh, on the one hand, I actually think a big part of it is still continuing to value reflection so that we understand why we're doing what we're doing, right? So you keep... Uh, um, so we all know folks who've been sort of, you know, cradle Christians of some stripe, and they grew up being immersed in those rituals, and it doesn't seem to have made any difference for their lives. And I often think that's because in their growing into them, they've actually never been invited to reflect on why we do what we do. And of course, that's why the, the Christian university is animated by both theoretical reflection and immerse, uh, um, being immersed in the practice. And that's why I hope nobody feels like this is an anti-intellectual project, because we, we get that. So I think that's part of it. Um, um, is there more? I mean, I, I'm genuinely interested in knowing. I, I don't know, because part of me, I actually spend time trying to get people to realize that there is virtue to going through the motions. With, but that's not the ideal. But the fact is, you know, when I'm raising, I have four kids, you know, teenagers and older, and in some sense, I knew that the spirit was working on them when they were immersed in our liturgical community, even on the days they weren't feeling into it. And I'm okay with that. It's just, yeah, you wouldn't want that to be a whole life, right? I also, I don't want to discount the fact that there are also special experiences of the spirit that reanimate and re-enliven and I think there are seasons to a Christian life where that would make a difference. Does that, does that all sound fair? Yeah. Totally. yeah. Great. Great. Other questions? We wore them out. I'm curious, I, I want to I continue on there, because I think you said uh, sort of throw away a side in that last comment, something that's vital. Yeah. Um, you, because most of your answer had to deal with the individual. Yeah. Oh. Mm. Mm. Um, but I think that part of, part of the way that liturgies as practices continue to shape us is the fact that we become embedded in a storied community. And so while there may be the moment where, uh, where my seven-year-old is bouncing off the wall, at, at, at times, that's okay. 
Yep. Because so we're she, acting she for her. Being story yep. By the community. Yep. And there are times when I go through dead ritual. Yep. Because what I need is for the community to have faith for me. Yes. Exactly. There are and moments where the community believes the story in a way that continues to shape me, though I may not be able to, to assent to it in the same way that they can. Totally. To is everybody hearing this? Because I actually think this is why the church has always had room to absorb our doubt. <laughs> right? Because we don't, uh, uh, like in other words, that doesn't surprise anybody. There's something about, for example, being in a part of a community who every week together say the creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And sometimes it's actually good to just listen to all the people around you who are saying that. And sometimes, you know, in my congregation, they've been saying it there for 110 years. And you realize, boy, I'm a pretty small part of this picture. And thank the Lord that there are people around on those days that I'm not believing. Right? To be honest. Um, this struck me most powerfully when um, uh, we had a niece who died very suddenly when she was 18 months old. And um, my sister-in-law and brother-in-law asked me to co-officiate the funeral. It was the hardest thing I ever did in my life. And the crazy thing about the Christian faith is we sing at funerals. We sing at funerals. And it's not because it's not some celebration of life be uh, garbage either. Do you know what I mean? This is, this is mourning and hoping. And, and I just, I looked at Jen and Luke, and there's no way I could have asked them to sing that. And I said, we will sing for you. We are here. You're not here by yourself. We are singing for you, and we are singing in hope that someday you will sing again. And, and I think you're right. That's, that's the, there's microcosmic examples of that, and you're, I, I'm glad you raised the question because this picture is meant to emphasize how communal our being the body of Christ is, and it's not just me and this private relationship with Jesus. Yeah, it's a great point. Just to add real quick to that, um, in Mudhouse Sabbath, Lauren Winter has a, a chapter on death in the, in, in the Jewish Orthodox tradition. And it's a, <coughs> if you're grieving, they don't let you out of the house for I think it's a week or two, and the congregation comes to your house. And then when, when that period uh, ends, they parade you around the house and then take you to the synagogue, but you don't sing. You can't mm. sing the mm. first time you're... Mm. So this whole communal yeah. liturgy of, yeah. of participating in that together. And that also seems to be honoring the physicality. Like, silence is also physical, right? To not sing in a context is physical. That's great. It's a question down front. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I think C.S. Lewis brought up more recently, I mean, Cornelius and Penny have touched on it, where you have this idea of... Um, uh, C.S. Lewis brought up, um, and Cornelius Plenty guys touched on this, of um, this idea of subjective and objective sins. That can do something that's su uh, subjectively right. I may think that's okay, but objectively I'm still sinning, and vice versa. Um, is it possible to, to do this, to do the exact opposite as well with um, sheer ritual? So subjectively do the right thing, but objectively do the wrong thing, or objectively do the right thing out of habit, but subjectively... I haven't really been thinking of it, so I'm not technically doing the right thing. Yeah, I, that's a great question. I would have to think it through, because here's, and again, this is slightly counterintuitive. I think if, if something like this model is correct, you have to rethink how much we prize sincerity. <laughs> right? So, okay, think of it this way. In our culture, I think especially in North American evangelical Protestant culture, we generally think of worship as primarily an expressive act that we do, right? So we come offering our praise up to God. And it's sort of what we do. Worship is bottom up. And therefore, the most important virtue that should characterize true worship, authentic worship, will be sincerity, right? It's why we hate hypocrites. Interestingly, in this picture, this model I'm talking about, worship isn't just expressive, it's also formative. It's also the space in which actually God is the primary actor. We are called by God into worship, and God is doing something to us. We respond, but God is the actor in worship. And in that case, then, it, my sort of expressiveness is less important than 
being there. You know, just being there is being in the way of where the spirit is at work. So I'd have to think through. I'd have to. I'd have to parse that a little more closely. It's a very. It's a very relevant question. It's a very good question, and I don't want to pretend to have an answer to it. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. You, uh, although my hearing sucks, so you might try. Or is bad. Okay, um, so my question is more of a life application where you can see it. I'm a philosopher, I don't do application. Okay. <laughs> right, so when you look at the Christian education system today, especially higher education, yeah. where do you see the vices that Christian education, what's the, the, yeah. uh, the most distinctive one that you would want changed, and what is the virtue that you feel that we ritualistically perform best? That's a great question. Um, I think the thing I would most like to change is to see Christian colleges, uh, to see the ethos of Christian colleges shaped by ancient wisdom. In other words, I think there, there are all kinds of ancient Christian disciplines and practices. It could be as simple as morning prayer and evening prayer, or the life of the Psalms woven into our lives, which are ethos shaping and imagination shaping, and much more formative than, say, dorm Bible studies, which are, for the most part, expressive, you know, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think kind of stuff, and, and overly intellectual. And it's not that intellectual is bad, it's just that we also need to be attending to the imagination. So I would love it if, if Christian colleges uh, um, instead of trying to invent new ways of doing spiritual stuff in the dorms and, and residence halls, actually just went back to ancient wisdom about what did the University of Paris look like in 1225? And I actually think we could learn a lot. What we do well, um, um, I think, I actually think, <laughs> no, 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 I was, I was just trying, there were so many things I was trying to pick up. <laughs> Without question, Christian colleges um, uh, uh, incubate community. Do you know what I mean? It's, I don't want to discount that. Do you know what I mean? It's actually where evangelicals kind of kick butt in terms of <laughs> spiritual practices, is that we get how to do fellowship, right? We get how to do intimacy, vulnerability. I think that's especially true of, of North American evangelicals. And that's not unimportant. So I, I want to kind of give credit where credit is due. I also think Christian colleges are getting better at taking the rigors of the life of the mind seriously. And that is part of this picture. And part of what we should be learning to do is actually to reflect critically on the cultural liturgies that we are immersed in. So I think that's a big part of it. That, that's on my feet, but that's a great line of questioning. Yeah. I think there's one at the front. Yeah. Um, so, you mentioned uh, kinesthetics, and uh, my question is, how kinesthetic should Christian faith become? Because, you know, back in high school, we had to say the pledge, 8.30 every morning, and yeah. no one's awake, and yeah. it kind of just becomes this robotic monotone. And yet, it's doing something to you. That's the wager. The wager is, and that's a pretty minimalist sort of ritual, right? But the wager is, is so what would, it, what would the difference be if you were... Um, my kids go to a Christian high school, and what difference would it be if they started every day with the creed? And what's, what would that sort of reinforce about who we are as a, as a community? So I, I'm, my, my intuition, my hypothesis is this, that there are ways in which the Christian story is carried in those practices that gets into you in a way that you, it can't any other. There, there's a great quip um, Mark Twain once said. He who carries a cat by the tail learns something he could learn in no other way. <laughs> you know, what he, mean, what he means by it is, even if I tried to describe to you and talk about what it's like to carry a cat by the tail, that will never be the same as you understanding what it is by trying to carry a cat by the tail. I would say, for example, there is an understanding of the gospel that you absorb in the Lord's Supper that you can't get any other way. 
You could, that doesn't mean you can't talk about the Lord's Supper, what's going on there, but there's also something, always something more going on. And I think we need to concurrently think about the Christian faith and be absorbing it in these imaginative ways that we can never fully translate into propositional language about it. Does that, does that get at your concern? Um, well, that, that meant, you know, that's talking about actual in-church traditions and creeds, but what about actions themselves? Like, should they become habit to the oh. point where we just don't think about so, it? So, yeah, actually, the full picture here is that I think we always act. Uh, let me back up. I think we overwhelmingly act not as the conclusion of deliberative processes, but actually out of unconscious and pre-conscious orientations that we bring to the world. So a lot of your actions in a given day are not the outcome of a processes, process you, you have deductively, deductively deliberated upon. It does bubble up from a kind of pre-conscious know-how, which is precisely why we need to attend to make, be more intentional about shaping our pre-conscious know-how because a lot of our action is generated on that level at the level of habit formation. And that is virtue. The virtuous person, the, the, imagine a perfectly virtuous person, of which I think Jesus would be the only one, but the perfectly virtuous person is someone who does the good without ever having to be told. Because the virtuous person, you know you're virtuous. Oh, oh, let me try it this way. I know I'm not virtuous. Because I will be in a situation in which I say, should I be compassionate here or should I not be compassionate here? As soon as you're deliberating, that's already a sign that you lack the virtue, right? Now, it's better to, divert, to, to deliberate than not. But if I were fully formed in the virtue, I would have this sort of disposition. So that, that would sort of bubble up out of me naturally. And that's now the kind of person I am. Um, that's exactly why. It's, it's my second book, Imagining the Kingdom, that, that uh, Jack mentioned, is all about, I think Christians have not thought enough about philosophy of action. Yeah, sorry, I, did, that, I sort of overwhelmed it there. But. Okay, cool, great. <laughs> uh, this is just more to share a story than to, uh, and, but I think it connects. Uh, I shared this with one of my classes recently. I was listening to Radio Lab a couple of weeks ago on a drive, and they were talking about gifting and talent and uniqueness. And in the midst of it, they shared this interview with Malcolm Gladwell. I'm not a huge Malcolm Gladwell fan, but in this particular instance, he was talking about, not about talent and giftedness, but he was describing Wayne Gretzky. You yeah. may have heard of hockey. Yeah. Okay. The, yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely. <clears throat> Wayne Gretzky's from my wife's hometown. Oh, cool. And, and the conversation was about this writing that Gladwell had done about Gretzky, and that Gretzky, it's not just that as a, as a baby he cried at hockey games and stuff like that, but he loved the game at such a depth that he thought about the game all the time, and he could do remarkable things because he thought about the game in ways that other people didn't think about the game. And I think there's something you're saying there about the habituation mm -hmm. and the kinesthetic and the kinesthetic mm -hmm. awareness mm -hmm. that really I thought that spoke yeah. to. So yeah, absolutely. I wanted to share it. And yeah, no, that's great. That's great. But it was always said of Gretzky that he didn't know where everyone was on the ice. He knew where everyone would be on the ice. Uh, and that, that was exactly what Merleau-Ponty would call practonosia, a kind of know-how that you could actually, very impossible to teach, because it's not something you could ever propositionalize. Yeah. A question about uh, rituals, habituation, and then authority. Yeah, Which Great. we're not really very good at in American no, evangelicalism. No, exactly, it's our problem. So, so what, do we, what do we do with this that? This is what happens when you found a country on a declaration of independence. Right. <laughs> Loyalists forever! Long live the king! Um, yeah, I actually think that there is no virtue where there isn't submission to an authority. Now, I would actually say what's ironic is, for all of our railing against authority, we are always already choosing to submit to some authority, right? So it might be in the name of scientific rationality that you throw off the authority of the church, but that's only because you've now placated yourself to some new authority. So I think we need to invite people to get over their anti-authoritarianism 
so by helping them to realize that they're not consistent in that regard. So now let's start evaluating who do you want to apprentice yourself to, right? There's no, uh, this is where Alistair McIntyre I think is so helpful. Uh, there's no, to be part of a tradition is to already submit yourself to an authority of those who have gone before who are masters in some way. But that's not, that's not authoritarianism because that tradition then equips you to go on and innovate and reform and it's a living tradition. I, it's a very important, yeah. Do you have any practical um, advice or virtuous rituals that we could engage in that might prevent us from being sucked into these macro implications yeah. that you talk about? Do you have an Anglican church in the neighborhood? <laughs> <laughs> um, I do. I mean, I, I really do think it is a matter of the, one of the best things that we can do for ourselves is to make decisions to be parts of congregations whose worship is fully orbed and is meeting the whole person. Too much North American worship is 30 minutes of emotive expressivism and 50 minutes of didactic deposition and is not actually governed by the story of the gospel sort of touching the whole person. So I do think there's wisdom, historic Christian worship practices on Sunday that will shape us. And then I do think, um, you know, if you want to say individually or Monday to Saturday kind of things in smaller communities, I do think the historic Christian disciplines, um, like, uh, um, uh, you know, the divine office of, of ordered prayer, um, actually is a way to take you through the story in ways that are more affecting than just intellecting. That's not a word, but you know what I mean. So, so a lot of it is um, really just rediscovering old Christian practices. Um, the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, th those, uh, to me, we, it's not that those have been tried and found wanting, it's they haven't been tried, really, by a generation. And um, my wager is that if we would reinvest in some of those historic practices, we would be a people whose Christian imagination would be transformed in ways that would change how we comport ourselves to the world. Yeah. I've been trying to think of a question and you finally gave it to me. Great. Why? Why did we lose it? Why did we lose it? Yeah, what you just said. Where, where did it go? Why, why um, did we give it up? Part of the story, I would say, is we, we actually, and this will sound ironic, but I think a lot of contemporary Christianity doesn't realize how much it is actually a product of the Enlightenment. That is, we actually bought into, at the same time that we were fighting Enlightenment rationalism, we actually ended up mirroring it. And so we kind of tended to reduce Christianity to a set of ideas. It's also why most evangelicals really don't have an ecclesiology. We don't really know what the church is for because we know it's really about having Jesus in my heart and having this personal private relationship with Jesus. And I guess church is the club where everybody else has a personal private relationship with Jesus, but we don't really have a rationale for it because it's this individualistic. So I, I think we are individualistic, rationalistic, and deeply modern. And we need to unlearn those processes. It's actually why I think postmodernism is a welcome development. Because it actually calls into question what's a problem with the root of modernism. I'm not saying that a lot of what goes on under the banner of postmodernism gives us then the resources to know what to do, but it is a catalyst to see the problem. And then it actually becomes an, an, a portal into pre-modern wisdom. Uh, and that's a lot of, I guess, what my project is about. Yeah. Great. Well, I think um, Jamie will be up here for a few more minutes if you'd like to ask any other questions, but let's, uh, he's leaving, never mind. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.